hear a lot about uh, Lake Michigan and its uh, ocean-like behaviors sometimes. And uh, if there is anybody who knows about how that goes, it's Dave Benjamin, who's with the Great Lakes Surf Rescue Project. And we've asked him to join us this morning to talk about that. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. Thanks for having me on today. Well, thank you for uh, being here. Talk about, for a second, if you would, what is the Great Lakes Surf Rescue Project? Um, the Great Lakes Surf Rescue Project, we have four key areas where we work. Uh, number one, we track the drownings in the Great Lakes. Number two, we teach Great Lakes water safety. And number three, we work with family and friends of drowning victims to advocate water safety. And then number four, we provide open water surf lifeguard training as well as first responder in-service training. Okay, so that's a pretty integral part. You're training the experts. Um. In some ways, yes. Uh, you know, we learn just as much from them, but um, say like the first responder in-service training that we do for, say, police officers, firefighters, paramedics, mm-hmm. uh, water rescue dive team members, um, one of the biggest things we're teaching there is, you know, the latest updates for water resuscitation. Um, years ago, the Red Cross and other agencies did a big push for compression-only CPR, yeah. and that's great if you're an old man like me and I fall down and have a heart attack on dry land. You know, that's a heart problem that's not circulating, you know, the blood. But with drowning, drowning is a brain problem. It's a lack of oxygen to the brain, hmm. and you have to make sure that you have the rescue breath in addition to the, the compression. And... Um, the simplest way to explain it is if I fall down on dry land, have a heart attack, you're doing compressions, you're circulating oxygenated blood. But if I'm pulled from water and you're doing compression-only CPR, you're circulating unoxygenated blood, which is essentially, you know, not doing anything for the brain. Huh. And and the, the thing is, the you know, with drowning, it's very, very, very time-critical. Right. If someone were to submerge in water and you get to them within two minutes and you do artificial respiration and CPR properly, about a 94% survival rate. But um, around three minutes of submersion, the heart stops. Around four minutes of submersion, irreversible brain damage begins. And by 10 minutes of submersion, if they're recovered and if artificial respiration and CPR has been properly performed, it's only about a 14% survival rate. Wow. So, you know, we. We explain, you know, two minutes of submersion could be a full recovery with no injury. Ten minutes of submersion is most likely a body recovery. And so that's why, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very important to understand the, the, the type of CPR for drowning victims, as well as understanding it's time critical, because if you're head of beach and you witness somebody submerge, how long does it take to get to your phone to call 911 for them to pinpoint your location, for them to, you know, dispatch responders, and for them to actually arrive, it's likely past the 10-minute mark, which goes into the next problem. Lifeguards are the first responders at the beach. They're there to spot somebody who's in trouble and prevent it or get to them before submersion. If you have no lifeguards at the beach, you know, your first responders are more than 10 minutes away, which is the body recovery time. Right. So it's up to... Uh, you know, bystanders to be out there making a rescue, and which comes the next problem. Would-be rescuers often become drowning victims. Oh, man. So this is is like a whole sea of problems, um, which are really actually simple problems. They're just not being addressed efficiently or effectively. Um, So, you know, I mean, we're, we're a huge, huge advocate that beaches should have lifeguards. And, and I'm not sure which which stretch you want to go first on this on this conversation. But, <laughs> yeah, you you've, know, you've given uh, me a lot to think about already. <laughs> so, right. It's still a situation where um, CPR is something that's best done when you're trained, uh, right? But it, you know, sometimes you see it dramatized, and I bet sometimes uh, laymen feel like they could give it a whirl. Well, one of the things, you know, with professional CPR is 
they want people to jump right into action, which, you know, don't get me wrong, it's great if somebody is on dry land and they're having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if, if somebody's pulled from water, if it's a suffocation, you know, you can run and start doing compression-only CPR and, and not be making a difference. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the difference it, then? How do you approach it uh, when it is a suffocation? Um, it's the same as drowning. Uh, the, the problem is the, the oxygen to the brain. The, the, the oxygen in the, in the lungs have been used up, so you need to provide oxygen. Um, you know, you need to provide the rescue breath. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many people would probably be apprehensive to do that because, you know, it, it could be icky. Um, but, but, you know, if it's an adult, uh, tilt the head back, chin up open the mouth or through the nose, you know, the two rescue breaths, and 30 compressions, and repeat. Um, we've, we've, we've actually, you know, worked with first responders, and we've actually had some people who have come to some of our classes that they had a drowning victim um, that they did compression-only CPR on, and then they felt like they had a responsibility, like I did the wrong thing. I made no difference. Uh -huh. I would have taken the next level of first responder, you know, CPR. Yeah. You know, did I, did I just, you know, participate in the death of this person? And, and then, then that's a huge, huge amount of grief that we wouldn't want anybody to go through. Right. Um, uh, the difference then is what we used to commonly refer to as mouth to mouth. Right. Right. Yeah. Dave, uh, if somebody is going to uh, a big lake this season, this weekend, whenever, what are the top, I don't know, three things that they need to remember? Um, well, first, it's kind of like the, the foundation of uh, water safety and drowning is that people really need to understand whether it's either, even a pool or a Great Lake or an ocean is that um, most people aren't familiar that drowning is one of the leading causes of accidental death in the nation and the world. Hmm. You know, so, so if you're not familiar with that, um, you may be less water safety vigilant when you go to water. Uh, the World Health Organization had even said in 2015 that drowning continues to be a neglected public health issue. And, you know, that statement came out, and most people have never even heard it, even some people in the water safety industry. Wow. So it's, it's just really, you know, important to understand that drowning continues to be a neglected public health issue. Um, it's one of the leading causes of accidental death. And you break it down for children 1 to 4, it's the leading cause. Children 1 to 14, it's the second leading cause, second only to car accidents. And then the nation as a whole is the fifth leading cause. And then understanding the statistics even more is that 80% of all drowning victims are male because males have a tendency to take risks, to overestimate their abilities, and they're more susceptible to peer pressure, and that's deadly in water. So if you got those young boys with you or even the old men, um, you know, we need to be woken up that, hey, we're leading statistics. Four out of five drownings are, are good, or is a high statistic. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the next part of it is um, there's a fallacy of, like, I know how to swim. I don't have to worry about drowning. Or my children know how to swim. They don't have to worry about drowning. But the statistic is that 66% of all drowning victims were good swimmers. So we need to understand that there's a difference between knowing how to swim versus knowing how to survive, and that you know knowing how to swim, may, you know, children may get less supervision. So it's just important to know that. Um, so that's kind of like the foundation of like the statistics, the, the the breakdown of it. But people also need to know what the signs of drowning are. They need to know drowning survival strategies like hook, float, and follow, and they need to understand dangerous currents on the Great Lakes. Right. Right. So. With the signs of drowning, there's typically the Hollywood version, which is like the old and new Baywatch, um, or there's, you know, the actual version. And the <laughs> Baywatch version is long, traumatic, yelling, waving, splashing, a traumatic event that lasts several minutes at the surface of the water. When the reality is, if somebody is drowning, you know, typically less than 60 seconds until final submersion. And they can't yell for help, they can't wave for help because... They're exhausted. They're choking on water. They're, they're panicking. And the signs of drowning is typically facing shore. Their mouth is at water level. Their head is tilted back. They're vertical and doing a climbing the ladder motion. 
And when someone's in that posture, vertical and climbing a ladder, and they look like they're just treading water, but if they can't answer, if their head's all the way tilted back, they're, they're going down quick and they need flotation immediately. So and this is, add, I was going to say, this is very key. The, the people on shore, lifeguards or anyone else, uh, have to constantly be scanning for those signs. Yes, you have to have a water watcher, whether it's a lifeguard or whether it's a responsible adult in the group of uh, people you're with at the beach. Someone has to be having their eyes on the water. Uh, they can't be on their cell phone. They can't be, you know, looking down the beach at the bikinis. they got to have their eyes on the water and be the responsible adult watching in case something happens. And then, again, they have to understand what drowning looks like, know, know what to look for. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, I forgot the statistic on it is, but, you know, there's usually an adult within 10 feet of a drowning victim. Wow. You know, and, and so it's because it's silent and it doesn't look like Hollywood would portray it. Yeah. And the parents are assuming they hear their child yell through a crowd for help. Um, but if they can't yell, they, they go down. Dave Benjamin is with the Great Lakes Surf Rescue Project. So if you're in the water, now we've talked about what to look for if you're out of the water. What if you're in the water and uh, you, you think you're going to be drowning? How do you react? Um, well, what we uh, advocate, you know, the signs of drowning for two reasons. So you could spot with someone in a crowd who's having trouble. And two, if you ever find yourself doing the signs of drowning, stop doing the signs of drowning and flip, float, and follow. And it's like the stop, drop, and roll of water safety. The way it works is you flip over on your back and you float. You float to keep your head above water. You float to conserve your energy. And then you float to calm yourself down from the fear and panic of drowning. And then you follow a safe path out of the water. And what's important to understand here is that flotation is the key. If you want to survive a drowning accident, you have to stay at the surface and continue breathing for as long as possible for either self-rescue or for a first responder or, or a bystander rescue if there's no lifeguards. Mm -hmm. So flotation is the key. It's the most important part of flip, float, and follow. And then follow is where we get the most confusion, where people ask us the most questions. Um, what does follow mean? It means follow the safest path out of the water. Well, what's the safest path out of the water? And unfortunately, each drowning situation is going to be uh, unique to the body of water, uh, the conditions of water, and the swimming ability of the person or the flotation ability of the person. Hmm. You know, so, so we want people to know before you put your toes in the water, and imagine if you got in trouble, would you have an exit plan? What's the conditions today? What's your physical ability today? Um, if you have any question about it, take something with you that floats. Wear a life vest. Um, you know, make sure there's rescue devices at the beach. If they don't have beaches, or I'm sorry, rescue devices at the beach, uh, footballs, volleyballs, soccer balls are just about always at the beach, and they actually make great flotation devices. An NFL football is enough to float a, a full-size adult if you could land it in front of them. You know, so that's why don't go in the water to make a rescue. Stay dry. Throw something that floats, anything that floats to a person who's drowning to interrupt the drowning process. All right. That's all good good advice. Now, we hear a lot in Lake Michigan, for example, about the rip currents. Uh, and uh, the thing we've heard most often is if you think you're in a rip current to swim parallel to shore, which is, I guess, counterintuitive. Is that still true? Um, well, it's still true that that's still being recommended as the best way to get out of a rip current. Um, I don't personally like it hmm. because uh, the waves on the Great Lakes are a little different than the waves on the ocean. Waves on the ocean could be caused by a storm that's two, 3,000 miles away. Waves on the Great Lakes is caused by the wind directly being on the Great Lakes. Okay. The big, dif the big difference is the swell period. So on the ocean, say there's 15 seconds from the crest of one wave to the crest of the next wave, okay, where you're going crest, trough, crest, and then 15 seconds. Uh, Great Lakes, the swell period is typically three to six seconds. Wow. So if you're at a crest and a trough every three seconds or you're getting hit in the face with the wave every three seconds compared to every 15 seconds, it's a higher frequency wave. You're getting five waves compared to two waves if you were, you know, in the Great Lakes versus the ocean. Mm -hmm. And the thing, the thing is, is um, because of the curvature 
of, of the shoreline of the Great Lakes, wind and waves are hitting the beaches often at angles, which create long shore currents that go parallel the shore. Yep. And they may feed out into a rip current that's not going perpendicular to shore, maybe going out at an angle. Um, also, these longshore currents, when they hit a pier or a structure, they're going to go out around the pier, which is going to be parallel. So it can be confusing. If I'm in a longshore current, if I swim parallel to shore, I may be swimming against the current. Or if I'm in a structural current against the pier, it's flowing parallel to the pier, you know, I may swim against the current if I swim parallel. Uh huh. The, the biggest problem with uh, drowning survival is that, you know, it's a marathon for your life. You need to know how to pace yourself. So um, it's not a race, you know, a sprint to get out of the water. It, it's a marathon. So you have to float. You have to pace yourself. You have to keep your breathing under control. Um, you have to assess which way the current's pulling you. And because it's a short period wave, you know, three to six seconds, you may not be able to tell which way it's pulling you because you can't see something solid on the shoreline that's not moving to right. assess which way it's pulling you. Hmm. So, so, so I, you know, that's why I, 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 you know, advocate flip, float, and follow. And, um, you know, a couple of things. Don't panic. It's important to know, but don't panic isn't a uh, action to take. So stop, drop, and roll, flip, float, and follow. It's an ordered task that has a psychological benefit to alleviate panic because you're following the ordered task. <laughs> All right. So don't panic is important to know, but, you, you know, it, it's not going to get you anywhere. And then swim is an action exhausting your energy, and then swim parallel may be in the wrong direction. So, um, so that, that's kind of my, my personal uh, opinion on the best – rip current survival strategy well it it makes a lot of sense and uh and the flip float and follow advice is the one that we'll uh, try and remember as uh, we head into the holiday weekend of course uh, if you want information about uh, anything that uh, great lake surf rescue project does all of that's on your website right yes um on our website on our home page there's a water safety tab it's got a, a surfer on it um, you go in there, and then there's uh, water safety tips, uh, bullet points, and each bullet point has hyperlinks to uh, a larger explanation. All right. So just uh, type it into the search engine, Great Lakes Surf Rescue Project comes right up. Dave Benjamin, thanks very much for your time today, and have a great weekend.